So we start with the subject wise test for pediatrics and in this session we will be completing question number 1 to 35. So question number 1 was the right aortic arch is associated with all except and the correct answer to this question is option number D which is trachea is deviated to the right of the midline. So they were asking you about the false statement about the right aortic arch. So normally, so question number one, the correct option is option number D. And normally the aortic arch is on the left hand side. So a right aortic arch is abnormal. Per se, the right aortic arch does not cause any major problems, but it may be associated with certain anatomical problems which are associated with it, which may need treatment. So in the right aortic arch, the aortic arch is seen to be traversing along the right bronchus instead of the left bronchus. So because of this anatomy of the right aortic arch, it pushes the trachea towards the left side. So there is deviation of trachea to the left side and not to the right as the question was saying. The right aortic arch is also associated with, with certain other chromosomal anomalies and important amongst them is the de George syndrome. So these are the few salient points that you need to remember about the right aortic arch. So now we come to question number 2 and question number 2 was a healthy 3 year old girl presents with acute onset of petechiae, purpura and epistaxis. Her HB is 12 gram per deciliter, TLC or the WBC count is 5550 and the platelet count is 2000. The most likely diagnosis is and the correct answer to this question is ans option number A that is ITP or it, as it is more commonly called or you should know the full form of this immune thrombocytopenic purpura. And why we have reached to this choice, I will just explain. So you see in this question, first point that you need to know is that it is a healthy child. So a healthy three-year-old child. So healthy is a clue here that you need to know. Then there is an acute onset this is another clue. Then you see that hemoglobin WBC count are normal but the platelet count is reduced. So you see HB is normal, TLC is also normal in this case but the platelet count is reduced. So this is the clue here. So because of these three salient points, we have reached to the conclusion of ITP. Because ITP occurs in healthy children and normally the other parameters in the CBC will be normal. And I will just explain what other choices you had. So in ALL, in ALL, it will not be acute. It will not be acute. It will be associated with other symptoms as well. For example, bone pains. Uh, and in CBC, you will find abnormal, the hemoglobin may be low and there may be a TLC also may be abnormal. The TLC count will also be abnormal. The TLC count may be raised. Sometimes it is seen even in lakhs. In aplastic anemia,
there will be evidence of pancytopenia in the CBC. So, in this case we know that the in our case the HB is normal, the TLC is normal. So, it is unlikely to be aplastic anemia and it cannot be ALL as well. In DIC, it is seen in a sick child. So, a healthy child cannot have DIC or bleeding uh, from sites in a healthy child cannot be because of DIC. So, in DIC the child is sick and the other uh, abnormality that can be seen is PT and PTK are also deranged along with low platelet counts. So, these are the reasons why ITP is the correct answer for this question. So, next we come to question number 3. And question number 3 was physiologic jaundice in a term newborn is best characterized by and the uh, correct answer to this question is a rise in serum bilirubin concentration of less than 15 milligram per deciliter. So, question number 3 the correct option is D that is serum bilirubin concentration of less than 15 milligram per deciliter. So, here in this question you need to know the differences between physiological and pathological jaundice. We know that the physiological jaundice in a child results due to immaturity of the enzyme systems to handle the bilirubin and hence physiological jaundice results. So, you should know that physiological jaundice it is never seen on day 1, never seen on day 1. It usually is seen around 24 to 72 hours. The bilirubin will peak, usually peaks around day 3 of life and then starts to fall. Bilirubin will peak at around day 3 of life. It has been the arbitrary uh, concentrations of bilirubin at which the levels are defined. It is said that any that if the serum bilirubin exceeds 5 milligram per deciliter on day 1, ten milligram per deciliter on day 2 and 15 milligram per deciliter any time thereafter it is classified or it can be classified into pathological jaundice. So, these are the arbitrary levels of bilirubin concentration where, whereby we can define that this is abnormal. So, any time when on day 1 if the bilirubin exceeds 5 milligram per deciliter, if it exceeds 10 milligram per deciliter on day 2 and if exceeds 15 milligram per deciliter any time thereafter it is classified as pathological. Apart from that pathological jaundice can also appear on day 1. can appear on day 1. These levels, these are arbitrary levels. If there is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and if the rise of bilirubin is more than 0.5 milligram per deciliter per hour, then it is classified as pathological jaundice. So, this is how physiological and pathological jaundice
can differ in their presentation and these are the salient points that you should know with regard to physiological and pathological jaundice. So next we come to question number 4 and question number 4 was not a clinical feature of Dandy Walker syndrome is and the correct option is option number A that is arachnoid cyst. So arachnoid cyst is not a component of Dandy Walker syndrome. So what are the components of Dandy Walker syndrome? In Dandy Walker syndrome you can have as the other options are herniation from the fourth ventricle hydrocephalus and a posterior fossa cyst. Along with that they can also be agenesis or hypoplasia of cerebellar vermis. There can be cystic dilatation of the fourth ventricle. Seventy percent of these patients may have hydrocephalus which may develop in the postnatal state. And along with that there may be atresia of foramen of Magindi. or foramen of Lushka. And there may be a posterior fossa cyst as well which is one of the options that is given to you in this question. So arachnoid cyst is not a part of Dandy Walker syndrome. Well arachnoid cysts are, what are these arachnoid cysts? These are benign cysts which are filled with CSF like fluid and they are normally seen in the CSF or the cerebrospinal axis. So these are benign cysts that occur in the cerebrospinal axis. and they contain clear colorless fluid that resembles like CSF and these cysts do not communicate with the ventricular system. So we come on to the next question. A four day old neonate has a synotic congenital heart disease. The child has central cyanosis and cardiac examination reveals a grade 3 systolic murmur. One of the drugs is commonly administered in the ICUs allowing the child to survive till corrective interventions are performed. And amongst the options that you had, the correct option is option number A option number A and that is prostaglandin E1. So prostaglandin E1 is a drug which is used mainly in ductal dependent lesions. Whereby closure of the ductus which is physiological after birth, the, uh, after the closure of the ductus, the child will not survive because of the congenital malformation that they have. So in order to maintain the potency of the ductus arteriosus, prostaglandin E1 is used so that the ductus remains open and the child can survive till the corrective surgical 
uh, repair can take. So, what are these uh, cardiac anomalies whereby prostaglandin E1 can be used? So, amongst the synotic lesions, prostaglandin E1 can be used in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. transposition of great arteries, truncus arteriosus, tricuspid atresia, and pulmonary atresia. And amongst the asynotic lesions, Prostaglandin E1 if you, uh, infusion can be used for coarctation of aorta. Critical aortic stenosis. And interrupted aortic arch. So, these are the indications of prostaglandin E1 in infusion. So, next we come on to question number 6 and question number 6 is red urine without RBCs is seen in and the correct option is option number A that is hemoglobin urea. So, red urine without RBCs is seen in hemoglobin urea amongst the options that are given to you. So, hemoglobin urea is a condition in which hemoglobin is filtered through the kidneys and appears in the urine and it is seen in conditions associated with intravascular hemolysis. So, uh, excessive hemoglobin that is filtered through the kidneys gives the urine a red color. However, present there is no RBCs if you do a urine examination in case of hemoglobin urea. So, in fact, this is a differential diagnosis of red urine. So, certain substances can mimic hematuria and give the urine a red color in the absence of RBCs and this one of these conditions is hemoglobin urea and other conditions are other conditions are intake of certain drugs intake of certain drugs like sulfonamides, pyridines rifampicin so these uh, are the uh, differential diagnosis of or these are examples of conditions which may give a positive or a false positive urine dipstick test. So, they will show a false positive if a urine dipstick is done. So, uh, there are other drugs as well phenytoin and even intake of beetroot because of the presence of betanin uh, pigment can also give red color to the urine. So, these are the differential diagnosis of a red urine in the absence of RBCs. So, the next question is true about familial hypophosphatemic rickets is and the correct answer is option number D that the inheritance is X linked dominant. So, they were asking you about the true statement.
So, question number 7. So, they are talking about x linked hypophosphatemic So, the salient points that you need to know about this condition is that it is the most commonly inherited is the most commonly inherited form of refractory rickets. It results in the results due to mutation in the FEX gene or the phosphate regulating gene which is homologous to the endopeptidases on the X chromosome. There is hypophosphatemia and despite hypophosphatemia, the blood levels of vitamin D3 are low. Amongst the clinical features, they usually have limb abnormalities, limb deformities rather, like coxa vera, genu valgum, and short stature. Coxa vera, genu valgum and short stature. Along with the limb abnormalities, there may be abnormalities of the maxillofacial region. And there may be dental abnormalities as well, manifesting in the form of dental abscesses and signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia are usually absent. Signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia like tetany and hypocalcemic seizures are absent. So next we come on to question number 8 and the question is which of these conditions is most likely associated with Williams syndrome. So question number 8 was about Williams syndrome and the correct option is option number C which is aortic stenosis. So, Williams syndrome is a developmental disorder, is a developmental disorder which is most commonly associated with supravalvular aortic stenosis. So, these children have moderate intellectual abilities, they have moderate intellectual abilities they have learning problems and they have difficulty with in visual spatial tasks
like drawing and making puzzles. But they do well in they do well in tasks that involve spoken language or music or learning by repetition. So they do well in tasks which involve spoken language, music or learning by repetition. So these are the salient points about Williams syndrome. It's a developmental disorder, most often associated with supravalvular aortic stenosis. They have moderate intellectual abilities associated with learning problems. They have difficulties in visual spatial tasks like drawing and making puzzles, but they do well in tasks which involve spoken language, music, or learning by repetition. So next we come, our next question is question number nine. And question number nine is deficiency of which enzyme system causes MSUD or the maple syrup urine disease? And the correct answer is option number A, that is branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase. So question number question number nine A branched chain. keto acid dehydrogenase. So this is the enzyme deficiency of which causes MSUD or maple syrup urine disease. And what are the salient points of uh, this condition? Well, it is a mitochondrial enzyme. That is involved in the degradation of branched chain amino acids amino acids like leucine, isoleucine and valine and deficiency of this enzyme results in MSUD which can be in the earliest uh, can be detected because of the smell of maple syrup in uh, like uh, the order of maple syrup in the cerumen which can be seen in the cerumen as early as 12 to 24 hours after birth. So maple syrup order can be seen in the cerumen as early as 12 to 24 hours after birth. By 24 hours, 24 to 72 hours of life, they will have poor feeding. Ketone urea. And irritability and drowsiness. followed by unexplained comma. The characteristic urine smell of maple syrup develops on day 5 to day 7 of life. And in advanced stages, there may be intermittent apnea, bradycardia, hypothermia, hypertonia, 
and seizure like movements. So, this is about maple syrup urine disease which is caused by deficiency of branch chain U keto acid dehydrogenase which is a mitochondrial enzyme. This enzyme is involved in the degradation of branch chain amino acids and a maple syrup order can be characteristically uh, be seen in the cerumen as early as 12 to 24 hours after birth. By 24 to 72 hours, the child can present with poor feeding, ketonuria, irritability and drowsiness. The characteristic urinary smell of maple syrup can be seen by the time the child is day 5 to day 7 of life. And in the advanced stages, there may be intermittent apnea, bradycardia, hypothermia or hypertonia and abnormal movements may also result. So we come on to the next question and that is question number 10 and question number 10 is which of uh, in galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase deficiency galactosemia the clinical features are hepatomegaly, jaundice, cataract and D all of the above and the correct answer to question number 10 is option number D all of the above. So there are three disorders of galactose metabolism but it is the deficiency of galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase or the GALT enzyme that is the deficiency of this which is referred to as galactosemia. So usually the children appear normal at birth but by day 3 or day 4 of life with the introduction of milk in the diet they may show life threatening disease. Manifesting with vomiting, diarrhea, poor weight gain and prominent renal and hepatic manifestations. Jaundice and liver dysfunction in this condition are progressive. Okay. So, this is about galactosemia. It results due to deficiency of galactose 1-uridyl transferase galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase children may appear normal at birth by day 3 or day 4 of life with the introduction of milk they may present with life threatening disease in the form of vomiting diarrhea poor weight gain and predominant renal and liver manifestations jaundice and liver dysfunction are progressive so next we come on to question number 11 which is which of the following is the most common cause of congenital hydrocephalus and the correct answer is option number C that is congenital aqueductal stenosis. So question number 11 option number C congenital aqueductal stenosis. is the correct answer. So I will just explain the uh, CSF flow how it happens. So the cerebrospinal fluid is produced from the choroid plexus and from the lateral ventricle, the two lateral ventricles through the for interventricular foramina.
the CSF goes into the third ventricle. and from, from the third ventricle it goes into the fourth ventricle and this is through the cerebral aqueduct. From the fourth ventricle it is through the lateral and medial apertures it is absorbed by the arachnoid villa So this is how the uh, CSF flow is. So from the lateral ventricle through the interventricle of foramina, they go into the third ventricle, then through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then through the lateral and medial apertures, it is absorbed by the arachnoid villa of all dural sinuses. So next we come on to question number 12. And question number 12 is identify the below. So there is an image based question and the, this image is that of a Shakir's tape. So question number 12, the image was of Shakir's tape. Now the Shakir's tape is used to measure the mid upper arm circumference and it is usually used by the field workers and you should know that the uh, mid arm upper circumference is an age independent criteria. So that means in case you are not aware of the age of the child but just by the virtue of the measurement of the MUAC you can classify whether the child has severe malnutrition or not. And the uh, what is important here is you, you should see these three bands, the colors that you are seeing. So there is a green color, then there is a small band of yellow color and then there is this red color band. So uh, this is important for the field workers in case they are not aware of the normal, uh, 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 normal range of the uh, mid arm upper circumference. But just when they measure the mid arm upper circumference, wherever this, uh, this uh, comes, they will know what to do with the child. So it has been seen that the MUAC when it is uh, less than 111, when it is less than 110 millimeters or 11 centimeters then this will come in the red color and this indicates that the child has severe acute malnutrition and he needs to be referred, uh, referred urgently for treatment. When they measure the mid arm upper circumference and it comes in the yellow band, then the mid arm upper circumference will be between 125 millimeters to 135 millimeters and then this will come in the yellow band. Then that means that this child is a borderline case and he will need a counseling for dietary rehabilitation so that he does not progress further to get into the category of severe acute malnutrition. So this is the child who needs some counseling right away. And if the minimum upper circumference is more than 135 millimeters, then it comes into the green band. Then that means the child is normal and he can be sent home and no active intervention is required for this child. So our next question is question number 13 which says a 10 month old unimmunized child develops fever and a diffuse maculopapular rash on day 4 of fever starting from face and spreading downwards. There is post auricular lymphadenopathy. What is the most likely diagnosis? And the correct answer is Question number 13, the correct answer is measles, that is option number 
B. So you see here that there is a preschooler child who is unimmunized and who develops, a, who develops fever and a diffuse maculopapular rash on day 4 of illness. So measles is caused, measles is a very important exanthematous lesion or an exanthematous disease that occurs in preschoolers and it is a very severe disease. It is caused by a RNA virus belonging to the paramyxovirus family. The virus is spread by droplet infection. And they have a prodromal period which is characterized by fever, fever, lethargy, conjunctival injection, rhinorrhea. Coplic spots are another very characteristic feature of measles. They are uh, seen just opposite the second molars. Usually they are seen 2 to 3 days on day 2 or day 3 of illness. And they are also, they appear as grains of sands with surrounding erythema. The rash of measles typically starts on day 1, day 4, sorry. The rash typically starts on day 4 and on this day there is rise in fever. So the rash appears on day 4 with rise of fever usually for, from behind the ear and you, we should also know that the secondary attack rate, it is a highly contagious disease, measles is a highly contagious disease with a secondary attack rate of almost 90 percent. And the most common complication of measles is acute otitis media. So these are some of the salient points that we need to remember from the MCQ point of view. So uh, the rash here in this question had appeared on day 4 of illness. So we knew that it, this was measles and the child was unimmunized. Measles is caused by RNA virus of paramyxovirus family. The virus spreads by droplet infection. Usually they have a prodromal period which is characterized by fever, conjunctival injection and rhinorrhea. Coplic spots is another characteristic feature of measles which appear opposite the lower second molar and usually on day 2 to day 3 of illness they appear as grains of sand. The rash typically starts on day 4. The rash typically starts on day 4 and at the same time there is rise of fever as well. Measles is a highly contagious disease with a secondary attack rate of 90 percent and acute otitis media is one of the most common complications that can occur after measles. So the next question which was quite a simple one, question number 14, which of these acyanotic congenital heart diseases is associated with volume overload? And the correct answer to this question is option number A that is VSD. So answer to question 14 is VSD which is a volume overload lesion and if you see the remaining two are pressure overload lesions which are coarctation of aorta and aortic stenosis. So whenever there is stenosis it will be a pressure overload lesion and wherever there is uh, excess flow or there is a regurgitant lesion it will be a volume overload condition. So in this case ventricular septal defect is the correct answer to this question. So next we come on to question number 15. 
and question number 15 was the peak velocity of growth during adolescence averages which of the following and the correct answer to this question is option number D that is 9 to 10 centimeters per year. So we know that the pubertal, uh, the, uh, the time of puberty is the second stage when there is a rapid growth spurt. So this is the second period and the pattern of pubertal development is different in girls and is different in boys. So girls and boys differ in their development of puber puberty. So it is seen that in girls, puberty starts around 10 years of age. the range being 8 to 12 years and which is completed over the next 5 years. Thilark is the first sign of puberty. This is followed by pubarch and the onset of minarch. Breast development may be asymmetrical in the initial phase and usually minarchy occurs 2 years after thilark and this is usually seen in stage 3 or stage 4 of pubertal development. So, minarchy may occur 2 years after thilark. or in stage 3 and stage 4 of pubertal development. While in boys, this is slightly different and in boys puberty starts with testicular enlargement and this is usually seen at around 11.5 years, the range being between 9 to 14 years of age. So usually the boys start puberty around 2 years later than girls and it starts with testicular enlargement which is followed by pubarch and spermarch occurs by around 14 years. So we come on to our next question and that is question number 16, fatty acid present in the breast milk which is important for growth and CNS development is and the correct answer is docosa hexaenoic acid. So question number 16, the correct option is option number A, docosa hexaenoic acid. So we know that the breast milk is rich in a number of factors. So the breast milk is rich in essential fatty acids, long chain polyunsaturated fats as well as phospholipids. So it also supplies enzymes such as amylase, lipoprotein lipase, and lactoperoxidases. These enzymes increase the digestibility of the milk and they also help in fighting infections. So the long chain polyunsaturated fats or the LCPs help in brain growth and they also help in preventing dyslexia and hyperactivity. Another important feature of breast milk is that the protein content is low 
and the way to casein ratio in uh, breast milk is 80 is to 20 which again is a feature which helps in easy digestibility of the breast milk. Apart from that breast milk is also rich in alpha lact globulin and lactoferrin. Now lactoferrin is important in breast milk which helps in the absorption of iron that is present in the breast milk. So these are the few advantages that breast milk has over other top milk, the cow's milk or any other formula milk. So this was about breast milk. Now we come on to question number 17. Question number 17 was earliest response to iron therapy in iron deficiency anemia is reduction in increased irritability, reduction in irritability and increased alertness. This can manifest within and the correct option is option number C that is 12 to 24 hours. So question number 17, option number C 12 to 24 hours. So we know that anemia can have a wide range of clinical manifestations. So when you start iron therapy, the a response can be seen in stages and the earliest response that occurs after starting iron therapy is increased alertness and decreased irritability that can come at around 12 to 24 hours of starting the therapy. So what are the other uh, imp uh, signs of improvement that you see over a period of time? So by 12 to 24 hours you see decreased irritability. So by 36 to 48 hours, you will see a bone marrow response in the form of erythroid hyperplasia. By 48 to 72 hours, there is reticulocytosis which will usually peak by around 5 to 7 days after 5 to 7 days of starting iron therapy. And then at one month, at around one month, there is increase in hemoglobin levels. And by three months of age, three months after starting iron therapy, there is repletion of stores. So this is how uh, improvement is seen in cases of anemia where iron has been started. So by 12 to 24 hours there is decreased in irritability. By 36 to 48 hours a bone marrow response can be shown manifesting as erythroid hyperplasia. By 48 to 72 hours reticulocytosis can be seen which peaks around 5 to 7 days and by 1 month an increase in hemoglobin can be documented and by 3 months after iron has been started, the stores would be repleted. So we come on to the next question and that is question number 18. And question number 18 was, ophthalmia neonatorum due to Neisseria gonorrhea usually appears from dash days after birth. And the correct answer is option number A. That is one to four days after birth. So now neonatal conjunctivitis can result from any time after birth to less than 28 days of life. This is usually either infective or this may be because of chemicals and infective 
conjunctivitis usually results due to the uh, infected maternal genital tract. So, according to the time of onset, chemical conjunctivitis can present right after birth. while that resulting due to Neisseria, Gonorrhea can result up till 5 days of age and that which results due to Chlamydia can be seen from day 5 of life up till 2 weeks of age. So this, so the correct answer to this question was 1 to 4 days. So we see that chemical conjunctivitis can present right after birth and that resulting due to chlamydia tra tra trachomatis can result from day 5 of life up till 2nd week of life. So with this we come to the next question and that is question number 19. Uh, DPT is contraindicated in which of the following conditions and the correct answer to this question is option number C that is progressive neurological illness. Question number 19 the correct option is option number C that is progressive neurological illness. So we know at present DPT or the diphtheria pertussis tetanus combination vaccine is presently administered as a part of the pentavalent vaccine which in the national schedule is given at the age of 6, 10 and 14 weeks as pentavalent vaccine and most of the side effects of DPT vaccine are due to the pertussis component. And there can be local pain, redness and induration after the vaccine is administered and there can also be high grade fever that results. Absolute contraindication to the DPT vaccine includes a anaphylactic reaction to a previous dose of DPT vaccine or if there has been development of encephalopathy within 7 days of administration of DPT vaccine. While the uh, one of the relative contraindications of DPT vaccine is progressive neurological illnesses. And amongst the progressive neurological illnesses, usually the neurodegenerative disorders come under this category. So if this is not one of the options, if a neurodegenerative disease is given as an option, then that option will become the correct answer. However, DPT can be safely administered in stable neurological disorders like cerebral palsy.
stable neurological disorders like cerebral palsy. So, sometimes there is a confusion between this and this. So, there should be no confusion with this regard from now. Uh, progressive neurological disorder is a relative contraindication of DPT vaccine, but it can be safely administered in stable neurological disorders like cerebral palsy. So, next we come on to question number 20 and that is death due to thiamine deficiency results due to and the correct answer is option number D that is cardiac involvement. So, question number 20 cardiac involvement. So, thiamine deficiency results in a condition called results in a condition called beri beri which results due to deficiency of vitamin B1 or thiamine as it is commonly called. Now, beri beri can be either dry or wet. In dry beriberi, the symptoms mainly involve the central nervous system, while in wet beriberi, the symptoms normally involve the cardiovascular system. And death usually in thiamine deficiency results due to cardiovascular involvement. So, in children or in patients who have developed thiamine deficiency, cardiovascular system manifestations may be seen in the form of dyspnea. The patients may present with dyspnea. They may have tachycardia. They may have signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. They may have cyanosis. Usually thiamine deficiency is seen in people who consume a lot of polished rice. or who consume highly refined maize and it is also commonly seen in alcoholics and food faddists. So, we see thiamine deficiency is also known as beri beri and beri beri can be dry resulting in CNS symptoms or it can have it can be wet beri beri in which the cardiovascular system is involved. So, patients who have cardiovascular involvement may have dyspnea, tachycardia, features of congestive heart failure or there may be cyanosis and thiamine deficiency may result in people who consume a lot of polished rice or highly refined maize and it is also seen in alcoholics and uh, people who are who have a lot of food fads. So, we come on to the next question and which was an image based question and you were asked the reflex shown in the image given below disappears by what age and the correct answer to this question is question number D that is 3 to 6 months. So, question number 21 the correct option is D that is 3 to 6 months. So, the reflex that was shown to you in this image was the Moro's reflex. which usually develops by around 28 to 32 weeks of gestation and it has three components that is when the head is just taken above like flexed and then it is allowed to drop suddenly then there are three components of this mo that then Moro's reflex results and there are three components of this reflex which are spreading of the arms or abduction. then bringing in of arms or reduction and usually associated with crying. 
So, this develops presents uh, this reflex is usually present around 32 weeks of gestation. And it usually disappears, usually it disappears by around 3 to 6 months of age. Persistence beyond 3 to 6 months of age can be seen in children with severe neurological deficits. and an asymmetric moros may be seen in children with birth injuries like fracture of the clavicle or in cases of herbs palsy. So, these are the salient points which you should know about moros reflex from the MCQ point of view. So, next we come on to the question number 22. And the question number 22 was, which of the following statements is true about zinc supplementation in childhood diarrhea? And the correct option is option number A. So, here they were asking you about the dose of zinc in childhood diarrhea and the correct option is option number A. So, in children who are less than 6 months, the dose of zinc is 10 mg per day and those more than 6 months the dose of zinc is 20 mg per day and it has been seen that zinc has a role to play in childhood diarrhea by, uh, by uh, helping the gut to recover and it also reduces the incidence of diarrhea in the uh, coming next 3 months. So, it can reduce the frequency as well as the severity of diarrhea. So, next we come on to question number 23 and question number 23 was eryptosis is. Now, question number 23 was eryptosis and the correct answer to this question is option number C that is suicidal death of RBCs. So, option number C or eryptosis. So, you can very, you very well know that apoptopsis is a programmed cell death. So, eryptopsis is the apoptopsis of the erythrocyte. So, eri and it is a combination of erythrocyte and apoptopsis. So, this happens when the cells or the RBCs get damaged and killed before their stipulated time span of 120 days due and so they get uh, they die before these 120 days. So, this is suicidal death of RBCs. So, usually this results due to exposure to or this results due to expo uh, either because of hyperosmolarity or to exposure to certain certain drugs or xenobiotics or due to presence of any oxidative stress. All this will result in eryptosis and this just like apoptopsis can be characterized by presence of cell membrane blebbing cell shrinkage.
and phosphatidyl serine exposure at the outer membranes. So, this was about eryptosis. So, we come on to our next question and question number 24 is to treat convulsions due to vitamin B6 deficiency which of the following is used and the correct answer is option number B 100 milligram of intramuscular dose. So, question number 24 was about the dose of vitamin B6 that is used to treat seizures and the correct answer is 100 milligram of intramuscular or parenteral dose. So, we know that vitamin B6 or pyridox is also known as pyridoxin. It has various active forms like pyridoxin, pyridoxamine, and pyri, pyridoxal. While most of the multivitamin syrups have pyridoxin as the main component. Vitamin B6 or pyridoxin is involved in enzymatic reactions of almost 100 enzymes. So, it has an important role to play as a cofactor in almost 100 enzymes. So, you can very well understand how important the vitamin is. Is. So, these enzymes may be involved in amino acid metabolism, in gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, Now, vitamin B6 deficiency can present with seizures in the young and in adults may have rashes. Sometimes they also present with refractory or normocytic normochromic anemia. Usually the dose of pyridoxin is not fixed and the dose varies depending upon the symptom complex with which the patient is presenting. So the dose can vary but in case of seizures the dose is a parenteral dose of 100 milligram intramuscular. However, with less serious and less acute presentations of vitamin B6 deficiency this dose may vary from 25 milligram to 600 milligram in oral doses. So, depending upon the symptom complex, the dose varies, but for seizures, the dose is 100 milligram parenteral dose. So, next we come on to question number 25. And question number 25 is all are true about coronary arteriovenous fistula except. And the correct answer to this question is option number C that small fistulas need to be treated immediately. So, question number 25, option number C is the correct answer. So, now we will talk about coronary arteriovenous fistulas. Now, coronary arteriovenous fistulas are a major coronary anomaly that can be seen in almost 0.002 percent of the population and this is one of the most common coronary anomaly that is seen. So, now these fistulas can either involve a chamber of the heart, they may involve one of the cardiac chambers, when then they are called coronary cameral fistulas. And when they, the fistulous opening is along with the great vessels adjacent to the heart, 
which can be either a coronary artery or the great vessels accompanying the heart. In that case, it is called a coronary arteriovenous fistula. So, the arterial tree or the coronary arteries can communicate with the cardiac chamber. So, when they communicate with the right side of the heart, that is the right atrium or the coronaries or any of its tributaries, then it results in a left to right shunt. And when it communicates with the left side of the heart, there is an arterial runoff. Basically, the uh, coronary steel phenomena is the main pathophysiology that results in the various symptoms that are seen in children with coronary arteriovenous fistula. So, this is the main pathophysiological problem in such children. So, the symptoms depend depending upon the amount of left to right shunt or the presence of coronary steel phenomena and this can result in angina, it can result in exertional dyspnea, it can result in palpitations. It can result in myocardial ischemia. There may be car, uh, congestive heart failure and there may be acceleration of atherosclerosis. And there may be cardiac arrhythmias as well. There is a general agreement that the symptomatic patients may be treated, but as of now there is a controversy with regard to the treatment of asymptomatic patients. But there is a certain school of thought which believes that even the asymptomatic patients should be treated because to prevent the risk of aneurysm formation or atherosclerosis or uh, development of other uh, cardiovascular problems in later life. But they need not be treated immediately. So, the crux here in this question was to be treated immediately. So, in asymptomatic or small fistulas, they need not be treated immediately, but they can be taken on elective basis and still there is controversy with regard to these patients. But symptomatic patients, they have to be treated. So, we now come on so now we begin with question number 26 and question number 26 was an image based question whereby they had shown you a physical characteristic and you were supposed to tell what the below image represents. So you were shown the uh, sole of a term neonate and the correct answer to this question was to question number 26 was term neonate. So question number 26 option number B term neonate. So, we know that the Ballard score can be used to estimate the gestational age of a newborn from birth till 4 days of life. So, this was one of the criteria that is used by the Ballard score to assess the gestational age of a newborn. So, the Ballard score uses certain neuromuscular criteria and certain physical criteria to assess the gestational age of a newborn. So, amongst the neuromuscular criteria that are used by Ballard score, they are the posture. So, if the child is like a preterm, then his tone would be less, he would be lying limp like a f in frog-like position 
and as the child matures, as he goes towards term, he will show active movements. So posture, square window, which is represented by the flexibility of the wrist joint, arm recoil, the popliteal angle, the scarf sign, and the heel to ear maneuver. While in physical criteria, the criteria that are used are the skin. So if the child is a preterm, the skin would be thin, reddish, parchment-like. And as the child grows towards term, it will become cracking. So the skin, the lanugo, the plantar surface, the breast development or the presence of the breast bud, eyes and ears. So if the child is a preterm, the eyes would be closed and as the mat child matures, you would see with well-developed eyelashes and the eyes might be open. In the ear, the ear cartilage would help you to assign the score which will help you to know the gestational age of the newborn. So the genitals, in the female uh, neonate, the present, uh, the, uh, how the uh, labia majora is separated and in males, whether the testes have descended or not and how, whether those, how much is the scrotum pigmented, all these will help to assign points which will help to assign the gestational age to the newborn. So this was about the Ballard score which is used to assess the gestational age. And in this, you were shown uh, the plantar surface of a newborn or the sole where we see that there are deep creases present which happens as the maturity progresses. So this was of a term neonate. So our next question is question number 27. And question number 27 was, a two-year-old girl child presents with recurrent episodes of diarrhea, mucus and blood at times hepatosplenomegaly, perianal excoriation, and resistant oral thrush. She weighs eight k 6 kgs and measures 78 centimeters in height. The most likely diagnosis is. And the correct option to this question is question number. The correct option to this question is option number C, that is HIV infection. So what are the clues in this question that led you to this answer? So here you have a two-year-old girl child who has presented with recurrent episodes of diarrhea. So there are recurrent episodes of diarrhea and there is hepatosplenomegaly, there is perianal excoriation and there is resistant oral thrush. And from the question, you also gather that the child has severe failure to thrive. So there is failure to thrive as well. So these clues help you to reach the diagnosis that this condition is because of human immunodeficiency virus infection. So you should know that the most of the children who acquire HIV result due to maternal to child transmission. So HIV gets most often, it gets transmitted from the mother to the child. Transmission is the most common mode of transmission of HIV in children. So this can happen either during the gestation or it can be due to, uh, during the delivery through the passage of the infected uh, genital tract or it can also happen in the postnatal period by, by means of breast milk. Usually children who are infected with HIV present with severe infections which are usually resistant to the commonly used antibiotics and they have recurrent infections with some unusual organisms. So the clinical manifestations of HIV in children, they vary, but the pediatric HIV has been divided into by two parameters. So children can be classified on the basis of the clinical status 
and the degree of immunological impairment. So, usually children who have advanced stage of disease, they are prone to develop certain opportunistic infections. So, it can be seen that children may have infections with pneumocystis gerovicae, with cryptococcus. or cryptosporidium. So, uh, children with HIV can be classified into clinical various clinical stages. So, in clinical stage 1, usually they are either asymptomatic or may have persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. While in clinical stage 2, they may have unexplained or persistent hepatosplenomegaly, they may have pruritic eruptions, they may have recurrent oral ulcerations. In clinical stage 3, they may have unexplained malnutrition or unexplained or persistent diarrhea. While in clinical stage 4, they may have unexplained severe wasting. or they may have certain unusual in infections like Kaposi sarcoma they may present with HIV encephalopathy and they may have severe candidiasis or fungal infections. So, in this child, this condition was resulting due to HIV. So, we come on to the next question and the next question was, which is not associated with kephal hematoma? And the correct answer is option number A that is present at birth. So, a kephal hematoma cannot be present at birth. So, in this they were asking you about a condition which is not associated with kephal hematoma. So, the correct answer is option number A that is swelling is present at birth. So, you need to know some important differences between caput succedinium and kephal hematoma from your exam point of view. So, the parameters which differentiate the caput and the kephal hematoma are the incidence. So, the caput is more common as compared to kephal hematoma. Usually the caput is seen in the subcutaneous plane while the kephal hematoma is seen usually over the parietal bones between the skull and the periosteum. So, the time of presentation caput can be present. Uh, the maximum size and firmness 
is seen at the time of birth. While in case of uh, Kefal hematoma, it usually takes 3 to 6, uh, it takes usually 12 to 24 hours, it increases over 12 to 24 hours after which it can be seen to subside. So now time, course, the caput progressively softens from birth. and it usually resolves within 2 to 3 days while kefal may take around 3 to 6 weeks to resolve. So the uh, it is diffuse, caput will be diffuse and it will cross suture lines while kefal hematoma never crosses suture lines. So this is also an important differentiating feature because it is commonly asked in your MCQs. So associations, there are hardly any associations that are known with caput, but with kefal hematoma, it may be associated with skull fractures in 5 to 25 percent of cases. So these are the important differentiating features between caput and kefal. So kefal is less common than caput. It is seen over the parietal bones between the skull and the periosteum. Usually the time of presentation is around, time of onset is around 12 to 24 hours in case of kefal, which usually progresses and starts uh, to uh, uh, soften by 3 to 6 weeks. It will never cross the suture lines and it may be associated with skull fractures in 5 to 25 percent of cases. So we next come on to question number 29 and question number 29 was which of the following is the best for transport of the newborn with maintenance of warm temperature and the correct answer to this question is option number A that is kangaroo mother care. So question number 29 the correct option is A that is KMC or kangaroo mother care. So uh, kangaroo mother care is the care of the preterm or the low birth weight baby that is carried by skin to skin contact with the mother or any other caregiver. It is not necessary that only the mother has to is the participant in the kangaroo mother care and it has now become the standard of care even in this technology driven world. So uh, in kangaroo mother care the baby is put uh, in by skin to skin contact with the mother in a vertical position and uh, kangaroo mother care can be either continuous or intermittent. Mother can be even encouraged to sleep while giving kangaroo care to the baby by uh, in a when she can give kangaroo mother care in a reclined or a semi reclined position. It has been seen that the heart rate respiratory rate, oxygenation, oxygen consumption all would be better in preterms or neonates who are given kangaroo mother care. So, and it has been seen that with the uh, by giving kangaroo mother care it has been seen that the milk output of mothers may increase it reduces the risk of nosocomial infections it increases and improves breastfeeding rates
it improves thermal protection that means the child is less prone to hypothermia and it also improve, improves or strengthens the maternal and the child bond and it has been also seen to reduce hospital stay. So these are the important advantages of giving kangaroo mother care. So now we come on to our next question and that is which of the following is not true about craniopharyngioma and the correct answer is option number A that it is one of the most common infratentorial tumors. So this is the statement that is false about craniopharyngioma. So question number 30 the correct answer is A which is actually false about craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngioma is one of the most common supratentorial tumors in childhood and not an infratentorial tumor. It may present with hormonal imbalances or hormonal effects of hypopituitarism. So the child may have growth failure, he may have polyuria or secondary to hypothyroid and adrenocortical insufficiency. It usually arises from a remnant of, of the connection between the Rathke pouch and the oral cavity. In most cases you may see calcification that can be appreciated on a skull x-ray. So these are the important points about craniopharyngioma. So it is one of the most common supratentorial tumors in childhood. It may present with hormonal effects of hypopituitarism. It results from a remnant of the connection between the Rathke's pouch and the oral cavity and calcification may be appreciated on skull x-rays. So the next question is which of which is the most important part of the immune system that is involved in immune mediated glomerular injury and the correct answer to this question is option number C that is complement. So there is complement mediated injury in case of immune complexes that are formed in glomerulonephritis. So the inflammatory reaction that follows any immunological injury results from activation of one or more of the me mediator pathways and the most common of these mediator pathways is the complement system which is of two types the classical pathway and the alternative pathway and both these converge at where C3 is formed and after which certain uh, chemotactic factors are produced which attract neutrophils and macrophages which result in immunological injury following any uh, which result uh, following immunological injury. So the correct answer to this question was option number C that is complement. So next we come on to question number 32. Intuitoception is associated with which of the following signs of acute abdomen and the correct answer is option number A that is dance sign. So we know about intuitoception.
it is one of the most common causes of acute abdomen in children between 6 months to 3 years of age and it is uh, one of the most common causes of acute abdomen. It results when a portion of the gut telescopes into the preceding segment. It is characterized by red current jelly stools. And often a sausage shaped mass may also be appreciated. and retraction of the lower retraction of the right lower quadrant of abdomen abdomen may also result which is known as the dance sign So these are the salient points about intuitiveception. So the dance sign results in intuitiveception. So when a uh, next question is question number 33 and that is when comparing breast milk versus cow's milk which of the following is higher in cow's milk and the correct option to this question is option number B that is concentration of casein protein. So question number 33, option number B, that is concentration of casein protein. So we have already discussed that breast milk has a lot of advantages by virtue of certain important components which the breast milk has which are not present in any of the top milks including the cow milk. So we will now see some salient points that differentiate breast milk from cow's milk. So these are the points over which we differentiate breast milk and cow's milk. So in water and solids are usually the same in breast milk and cow's milk. Calorie count is also almost the same which is 67 calories per 100 ml which is also the same as in breast milk the cow's milk also has same calorie proteins are 1 percent in case of breast milk while it is 4 percent in cow's milk and another important feature is that the proteins in breast milk are whey to casein ratio is 80 is to 20 which helps in easy digestibility of the breast milk while in case of cow's milk this ratio is reversed so the way to casein ratio is 20 is to 80 so a higher protein content and that to casein predominant protein in cow's milk leads to uh, difficulty in digestion. So this is the reason why breast milk is easy to digest as compared to cow's milk. So in the carbohydrates, the content is 7% in case of breast milk which is predominantly lactose while in case of breast milk this is 4.5%. Fats are almost similar, 4% in breast milk which is diet dependent. and which is again 4% but this is pooled. In the minerals, by virtue of the presence of lactoferrin, iron is better absorbed with breast milk. So low iron absorption is seen with cow's milk and in vitamins, Vitamin K is deficient in breast milk while vitamin K 
is abundant or more than breast milk. So these are the important differences between breast milk and cow's milk. So we see that the calorie content and the water and the solid content is the same but the proteins are lesser and the content is also favorable for easy digestibility. The carbohydrate content is higher with lactose as the predominant sugar in case of breast milk. Again the fat content though is same but di uh, fat content in breast milk is diet dependent. Iron is better absorbed in breast milk and vitamin K is deficient in breast milk but has more in case of cow's milk. So next we come on to question number 34. Question number 34 was again an image based MCQ and you were supposed to identify this image and the correct answer to this question is option number B. That is the laryngeal mask airway. So question number B is a laryngeal mask airway. So the laryngeal mask airway or LMA as it is commonly called, it is used during anesthesia to keep the airway open, to keep the air open in, uh, in unconscious patients or where the airway has to remain patent. It forms an airtight seal over the glottis. And unlike the endotracheal tube, the endotracheal tube crosses the glottis and reaches up till the carina. But in this case, it will form an airtight seal over the glottis, allowing a secure airway to be managed by the healthcare provider. So many a times laryngeal mask airway are used in patients with difficult intubations or where the healthcare provider is unable to intubate the child or the patient because of any reason in that cases LMA may be useful. So this is the differentiating point between the LMA and the endotracheal tube intubation. The endotracheal tube will pass through the glottis whereas the LMA will form an airtight seal over the glottis but will maintain the airway. So next we come on to question number 35 and question number 35 was which of the following is the most common sustained tachyarrhythmia in children and the correct answer to this question is supraventricular tachycardia. So option number B supraventricular tachycardia. It is also commonly known as SVT and it is one of the most common sustained tachyarrhythmia in children and the incidence is 1 is to 4 per 1000 patients and it can present with tachycardia, heart rates reaching almost 250 to 300 per minute and occasionally there may be signs of CHF as well. The ECG will show a regular heart rate with a heart rate of 250 to 300 per minute like we have discussed and the drug of choice for SVT is adenosine which is preferably administered in a vessel which is close to the heart because it has a short half-life so it has, be, it has to be administered in a vessel which is close to the heart so that it goes and it's, uh, it can quickly act to settle the heart rate. So these are some salient points which you should know about SVT. So this was question number 35.